there will be time where you'll be able to uh, to ask questions along the way. All right, I will hand it over to I will hand it over now to our presenter, uh, longtime MHSAA multi-sport official. Uh, it is uh, Sharon Sawyers, and she will be presenting tonight's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Uh, I'm privileged to uh, present this information to everyone. I hope you enjoy the information that I present. And uh, also, before we get started, a thank you to Brent for putting together all of the Officiate Michigan Day uh, components. So tonight, I'm going to be talking about our two transition mechanics. Um, and we're going to talk about the importance of our two mechanics. For the game as a whole, transitions allow the R2 to take a better position for decision making. Uh, it's volleyball is at the higher level is a very fast paced sport and we have to work quickly and efficiently to get in position uh, to make the best calls. Uh, one oh. of the things for the game is okay. the ball deceptively moves to both teammates and opponents. So again, as the R2, your ability to help uh, your, t your R1 is critical. We doing okay, Brent? The R2 is uh, one of the nice things with the R2, they have the ability to move to get a better angle or position. Uh, Whereas the R1 is obviously restricted to the stand and can't make any side to side movements to get a better angle that we can as the R2. For the official, do you want a headset? Moving uh, to adjacent, to adjust uh, his or her position shows good volleyball instinct. You're anticipating, but yet you're not anticipating where the ball is going to go. So having that instinct gives you a better opportunity to get in a good position. Um, effective transitioning and minor position adjustments are just examples of good advanced level officiating. What are you as the R2 should be looking for? The R2's primary responsibilities during a rally are obviously violations at the net. This is going to include such things as uh, hitting the net with their hands, their body, when, and landing and their feet crossing, or if they slide their body crossing the center line. The other primary role for the R2 is to, to assist our R1 with ball handling violations. And an, way to do that is to give very discreet signals to the R2. Um, and an opportunity to, to do that is if the back of the player is to R1 and they are screened out and cannot see the play. So a simple assist on that is a great opportunity for the R2. Hey, each is just as important as the other. The focus is on timing. When there is a high probability that there may be an illegal action at the net, the R2 should focus, should be on the net there. Net or center line violations are for the R2 to whistle. When there is little to no chance of a violation occurring at the net, then the R2 should move his or her focus to assist with bog handling legality. All handling violations are whistled by the R1, though the R2 can and should provide discrete and informal signals to the R1 if necessary. And again, when I, an example of that is if the player's back is to R1 and they are screened out from an illegal or a double hit where it clearly rolls up the uh, player's arm. Position and mechanics during the serve. Prior to the serve, as the R2, you will begin on the receiving side of the net. You should be squared to the court. And the reason for being squared to the court is so if out of the corner of your eye, a coach for the serving team 
wants to call a quick timeout or something happens on that side. If you've turned your body away from that, you're blocking yourself out from seeing that activity. You should be approximately three to four feet back from the net post. I know in some gyms it may not be uh, conducive to be that far back, but if you can, the farther back you can be in that three to four feet distance, it's going to give you a better angle and view of the entire area. Your inside foot should be nearest the center line, on the center line extended. This is not a good position to have during a rally. However, uh, it allows you to quickly transition to the blocker side on the serve. Your focus should be on the receiving team members' positions, checking for uh, illegal alignment, overlapping, or if your setter is taking off too uh, quickly. Next slide. We go to the next slide there, Brent. I apologize, it is not advancing to the next slide. Are you, you're not able to, um, sometimes if you click off or click on the, with your mouse. Okay. And then try to forward the slide. No, it's locked out. Let's see. Now it's been paused. I apologize, everyone. There we go. All right. After the serve, uh, you should be immediately transitioning to the other side of the net following the serve. This takes an aggressive step with your inside foot to the other side of the court, followed by your outside foot slightly behind. A lot of times people will refer to this as a karaoke, karaoke or a grapevine step. You want to probably be two to three feet off the center line at this point with your body and shoulders slightly toward the net. If we go here, this is an example of the court. You can see uh, the server is on the left-hand side of your screen. Your R2 is positioned. Again, you're tight to the net, uh, facing the net, but you're gonna be two to three feet off of the, away from the standard. You're not gonna be tight against the standard because that's gonna block your view of the court. Again, by backing up, it gives you a better angle of everything on the court. Now, as we, this is a pretty cool uh, animation. As the serve goes, you will watch the R2, the blue dot on the bottom will transition over. That way they can see through the net and they can see the re uh, person receiving the ball. But again, it immediately gets you to transition so you're ready for the, to be on the defensive side of the ball. One more time, ball serves, your R2 is transitioning over, but is available, able to see through the net to see your receiver. Okay, position and mechanics for the first and second contact. When receiving the serve, R2 should remain with his or her body and shoulders squared to the center of the net. Unlikely that an illegal action is occurring at the night. So it's a high ball or it's just a free ball going over and nothing's gonna happen. You should assist R1 in determining ball handling legality. Look for two players contacting the initial serve. We've all had that happen where two uh, players are side by side and actually the two arms from each player one from each player hits the ball. That is actually two hits, that is not one hit. And sometimes that is very difficult to see. Again, the backside contact where R1 must look through players or is screened by the bodies. Additional contacts as well. R2 should stay with the play until it moves toward the net. Focus will then turn toward the net and center line. At this point, you should be two to three feet outside of the standard and three to four feet back away from the net. 
If the ball is played over the net prior to an attack and rally continues, you will transition to the new blocking team side. This is a move with a purpose. That's something we use in all of our officiating sports, whether it be volleyball, basketball, baseball, softball. We always want to move with a purpose. We're not just sort of sauntering side to side. Move, get in a best position, picking up the flight of the ball as you're transitioning over. Again, transition often easier with a crossover step with the outside foot first, followed by the inside foot to establish position, turn slightly toward the net. All right, here is an example of the transitioning. This is the serve, the middle back is receiving. You can see that the R2 has trans transitioned to the opposite side so that they are now on the uh, defensive side of the court. One more time, again, they're transitioning. Because that's a high arcing ball, you know that there's not gonna be any play at the net, so you're able to transition over to the other side. All right, position and mechanics during an attack. On the attack, as the ball comes toward the net for the attack, R2 should direct his or her attention to the action at the net. R2 should look through the net for net faults, as well as having an angle of, to see takeoff points of back row players and libero plays near the attack line. Again, just as a reminder, you are responsible for both sides of the net as the R2, both for the uh, offensive and defensive. So being able to see through the net will give you the ability to see all of that. As the attack is occurring, quickly scan your eyes from the top of the net to the bottom, looking for contact by players on either side of the net and looking at the floor to make sure no foot completely crosses the center line. If contact occurs with the net or a violation of the center line, or excuse me, a violation on the center line occurs, the R2 should blow your whistle, transition to the fault side if you're not already there, point to the net, and that would, it, mechanic is a single finger point to the line. You do not have to touch the net or anything like that. Again, it is just a single point to the center line. The num and then you display the number of the player at fault to the R1 and award the point to the award winning team. Again, one of the things that we want to remember is when we are giving the number of the fault, it goes to the R1 and then it is the R1's responsibility to relay that information to the benches to let them know which uh, player was at fault. Okay, and then following an attack to the other side of the net, R2 should turn his or her attention to the team playing the ball first, then transition to the other side. You know, if you're watching the ball and you clearly see it shanks and it's gonna go out of bounds, you're not gonna transition to the other side right away. Position and mechanics for a rally at the end of a rally. When the ball is down or out or a fault occurs, R2 will step laterally from the net post toward the side opposite the scoring team with his or her shoulders parallel to the sideline. Both referees will make contact, eye contact with one another as they execute the proper signals. One of the things when you're working together and making eye contact, this gives you the ability to non-verbally communicate with your partner so that your timing is in sync. If the R1 is going too fast, you can also sort of in the, indicate to them through eye contact because they should be aware that they're going through their mechanics too quickly because you're still transitioning and you're not able to get the mechanic down with him. So again, it's a timing thing that you work with uh, R1 and R2 together, making eye contact and making sure you're in sync are key. All right, keys to remember. Other than on serve receive, 
R2 shall watch for any net violations as the ball crosses the net. If you see first, first contact following attack, you light, left, you likely left the net too quickly. So if the hitter is swinging in the attack and you actually see the player receiving the ball, your eyes have left the net too quickly because you're not able to see if there's any follow through with this hand motion, which would be a net violation. Or you're also supposed to watch her feet when she comes down. If his team is returning a free ball high over the net with no blockers and no attempt to block, R2 can transition sooner and focus his or her attention on the initial pass. On occasion, a secondary transition may be necessary to open up a better angle. R2 should not be afraid to move to see what he or she needs to see. Again, that is an important and a key thing for the R2 because R1 cannot get off the stand to get an angle. As the R2 on the floor, we can move to get better angles. The R2 should not try to help too much with ball handling. If the R1 doesn't take the call, R2 should move on and continue off ball. With that being said, what we're saying is if you're working with a newer official as and they are up in the R1, sometimes we will help them a little bit with our a call. We may signal for hits, lift, back row player, et cetera. Um, but again, we don't want to hold that too long. It's just a one to two second quick flash. If they don't take it, move on. The mechanic that's relatively new is no mirroring required when the ball crosses the stands standard outside or touching the antenna on the R2 side. So the ball is out. Our job is to sound the whistle, move to the fault side, and give the out signal. Okay, any questions? Anything else sure. to add? Yeah. Sharon, a couple of uh, uh, things that came in, and, and uh, one I think is a, a comment uh, from Debbie. Uh, she talks about that uh, she strongly suggests that the R2 not transition until first contact is made. I think that's probably the general rule of thumb, but I'll let you uh, speak to that uh, briefly. It, it, it's If you're moving before first contact is made, Debbie, that's a great point. Um, you're moving too quickly because in one of the other slides we talked about the first and second hits. Uh, so holding that spot and you're not going, if you're transitioning, you're not going to see that first hit. So you're correct that we should probably wait until after the initial hit before we start our transition over to the other side. And then the, the, other question here was a question to an earlier slide. It just was yeah. asking uh, if there are two hits that are a lot, uh, excuse me, if two hits are allowed at serve, does this not qualify if contact is at the same time? An individual is allowed the double hit. However, if it is two players hitting it simultaneously or a split second, that is considered two of the hits. It is two hits. Any other questions? Or uh, you can open up your mic if you'd like to participate in the discussion as well. Could I get clarification on that? On the double hit by two players? Yeah, if we've got two back row players mm -hmm. trying to get the ball at the same time, and, and sometimes, I mean, the ricochet is so quick off that. Right. Uh, so is, are we to judge that or consider that? That is, that is going to be a judgment call, but if you strongly feel that it was touched by two players, 
that is hits one and two. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chair and Kent Neitzer, I think I think you'd be a little careful there. If two players hit the ball simultaneously, it's called, it's deemed as one contact and either player has the ability to contact it the next time. That's so, what I thought. Yeah, I just, I just looked it up. This is Nancy Brock and it's um, rule nine, four, article six in the, in the current, in the new rule book. And it, and it does say that if two, if two people contact the ball at the same time, it's counted as one hit. And either of them can then go ahead and play it. What happens frequently is that two players reach for the ball and it hits one and then the other, whether it's quickly separated or maybe sometimes there's quite a little bit of separation, but R1 does not see that. And I think what Sharon is trying to say is then that is R2's responsibility to help make that four hit call that's going to do happen uh, in two more touches. Correct. Thank you, Kent. Another uh, question that came across, and I, I think that this was talked about regarding ball handling uh, assistance that R2 gives. Uh, first of all, they, they probably should not be in general, uh, focused on ball handling primarily, you know, they should, they should give assistance, but not too often. Um, but the, the, I guess the piece is especially, how does that apply, especially to younger officials or newer officials to the sport? Um, where should their focus be? The R2, if you, if you're a younger official and you are in the R2 position, you're, not going to probably be giving assistance to the R1. Um, sorry about that. Um, when you are the R2 and you're the veteran official, that's when you're going to probably help your R1, especially if they're a rookie and unsure as when, how tight to call something that's when the veteran official will assist in giving a quick signal to help them out. You don't wanna do it all the time because then what is going to do, if you do it too often, the coaches are going to uh, take away the credit, you're taking away the credibility of the R1 to do their job. And they're gonna you know, turn to the R2 and say, why are you you know, giving them all the signals, don't they know how to officiate? So again, we have to be discreet and we have to not do it too often, but sort of periodically to help that newer official. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any more questions in the chat. Oh, sounds like someone. Yep. Uh, I got another, one of the other things, Sharon, you mentioned about secondary transition. I think one of the things that's important that R2 in their secondary transition, if you meet, need to get moved to get a better look at something, that secondary transition should not be away from the farther into the backcourt than you are. Otherwise, you're going to end up missing um, net things that are happening at the net and miss call that. So generally, the secondary transition is closer to the net if the play is on the far side from you and maybe back away from the net if the play is near your antenna so you have better peripheral vision at what's happening. Correct, yep. And an, another example for that camp might be is if the attack is right in front of you and your outside hitter you know, has an angle coming towards you, you may have to adjust your position so that you can see them, you know, the attack in the net as well. So that would be a secondary positioning as well. Sharon, this is Debbie Kirby's bets. I just wanted, th first off, thank you for doing this. And secondly, um, I think one thing, especially for young officials, we need to teach the trait or the um, skill of centering with the R1. In other words, looking at each other and making sure that you're basically knowing what they're going to do, what call they're making, and, 
anticipating your call or letting them know that you have something through the through the rally. Um, I think that seems to help bringing the two officials as one together in, in calling the game. Right. right, very much so, Debbie, thank you. Um, and the other thing too is, as an R2, you want to make sure you are mirroring the R1 and not, especially if we're a veterans, we may think they're going to call a lift, but they end up calling a double hit. We don't want to, as the R2, make the uh, mechanic too quickly because then the coaches are watching us. And I had a coach do that, says, well, you just called the lift and he called a double, what is it? Okay, so we, as the R2, we have to remember that we are mirroring the R1 because it is ultimately their call. Sharon Kent Neitzer, one other thing, um, when you talked about R2's responsibilities, one of the responsibilities that was not listed there is you have bench control and table control. So mm -hmm. you can't, you, as you said, when you start, you start square to the net because you need to be observing anything coming from either bench or if we're, if someone from the table is trying to get your attention, you need to be aware of that. And I see, especially in young officials, they get focused so much on the game that there are uh, coaches trying to call timeouts or substitutes trying to get into the game and we're not aware of them until they basically have to yell us or tap us on the shoulder. Yep, exactly. And as, uh, as we become seasoned as uh, our two officials, and most of us are familiar with a game when a server scores three, four, five straight points, you almost are anticipating that a coach may have a substitution or a timeout to try and break the momentum of the server. So as the R2, you may want to take a quick glance over at both benches or the bench that may be wanting a timeout. And if you have your back turned and you're not parallel, then you're not going to see that. And then you, the coaches are going to you know, get upset because they wanted to try and get that timeout. Great point, Kent. Looks like there was another question here or question comment uh, regarding something that was taught. It says, I was taught to step back after every dead ball to open the door for timeouts or subs. Is this a good practice? Um, to open the door, I think, again, it goes back to court awareness, uh, the situation. Um, as the R1, we sort of scan the full court. It's not a bad idea uh, to get in a habit of scanning the court as the R2. You know, do a quick glance at both of the coaches uh, just to see if there's any activity. Maybe there is a slow moving substitution, not that it's going to be late or anything like that, but a coach may stand up to get a sub going. So by taking that quick glance, you're going to do uh, some preventative officiating so that they're not going to get upset that they tried to get that sub or the sub is coming up to the substitution zone late. So yeah, definitely, a, you know, a good habit in to get into of scanning the court and taking a quick peek at both sides. Sharon, I'd like to add also that the R2 is in charge of the table and it's very important, especially for sub varsity matches that the, um, R2 is fully aware from the table's um, information that everybody is supposed to be where they are, uh, number of serves. I know you have a card. I know in high school we use a card to mm -hmm. record our subs and record our timeouts so we don't get into a thing. But, the, but even a quick comment to the table to bring them back into the game after at the end of a rally to make sure that they got the point recorded to keep your scoreboard always up to date. I think mm -hmm. that's very important for the R2 to do. So the R2, in my opinion, is the anchor to this ship. Um, you are looking um, always at your R1, but you're always looking at your um, two sides of your boat and 
also the bow of your boat to make sure that everybody is where they're supposed to be and what they're doing. Yep, very much so. Great, great feedback, Deborah. I, I agree 110% on that. Um, you know, we we have to, like you say, the, the table, the coaches, the substitutions, making sure that everybody's in sync. Um, you know, and we do a lot of that preventative and mechanics and officiating during timeouts. But like you say, the sub varsity uh, matches, especially the table and making sure that they're all in sync and on the same page uh, early on. And early in the season, checking the book early in the matches to make sure that these kids aren't doing club scoring. Um, I think uh, we've all had that example, whereas in club, they don't do a lot of this same uh, federation mechanics. So you go and it's 10 to eight and you walk over there and they virtually have nothing written on the scorebook. So we want to, you know, uh, make sure that they are know how to properly keep a score uh, for the federation rules. And if they have any questions to make sure they let, get us, you know, get our attention and we get it corrected right away. Um, you know, illegal server, auto rotation, uh, and things like that. So yeah, very much so, Deborah. Sharon, I, this is Kelly Hart. Hi, Kelly. Hi, I just had one addition to that, um, to what Debbie was mentioning as well. Uh, I always train that if you are giving a substitution that you don't, you don't walk, definitely do not walk towards the subs. So if you are at a place where you're good and you can just do your substitution signal and then um, beckon the, or not beckon, but um, allow them to go in, that you don't need to move from where you're at. And that also gives that sight line of sight from your score table. And if you are in the way of the score table, then that would be the place where you would be basically take one step back. But otherwise, stay right where you're at and just let that action take place. It just it just makes it smoother and you're not running all over the place. I agree. Yep. And like you say, if you have a good table, you just sort of get out of the way and let them do it. And then, you know, uh, signal for the players to the substitutions to go in. Um, but yeah, and you, you'll know I, I all that, you know, you should know all that prior to starting the match. You know, <laughs> yes. <table. Yeah. laughs> And, you know, you review all the stuff, you know, the, the timeout mechanics, uh, you know, um, where your libero tracker is and, and things like that. Those, those are all things that the R2 is going to handle, you know, pre-contest. A busy job. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Brad, this comment is for you, and this is not to slam you or Michigan High School Athletics, but a comment was made in the chat room about you have an R2 for sub-varsity. We should. There should be no doubt that an R2 should be hired to do sub varsity matches. This is not fair to the players. This is not fair to the coaches, the table. For a couple extra bucks, you have a unified team of officials doing sub varsity as well as varsity. And I think it's atrocious that so many schools will not hire that second official for sub varsity. Sorry if I stepped on toes, but it needs to be said. You didn't step on my toes. I uh, wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, uh, I, I support putting you know, the officials out there, not only because it's better for the, the athletes, it's better for the gameplay, uh, but it's also better for the officials. Not only the officials that are working, uh, you know, the, the official that has to work by themselves, but also... Uh, or by themselves, but also for that official that we could be putting in there to develop them to move up to varsity matches. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I can tell you that we have officials review committee uh, that is meeting at the end of September, and we are going to discuss both uh, fee, game fee, minimum maximums, as well as minimum maximums for contest in all of our sports. So it, it is on the agenda and will be discussed in uh, late September. Brent, is part of that, you ask, is, it, is it also open for discussion, um, you know, having somebody other than the freshmen and the JV players as line judges for varsity matches? 
because you know how many times we've had the the freshman player who's who's there at a critical point in the match and you know they're deer in the headlights as the ball comes near them it is uh yes that's that's all part of this same discussion i will tell you that there so there's a couple of things that will likely come up um uh, officials are always looking for minimum number of officials and the um and the schools are always looking for the maximum number of officials and so uh for instance in some sports like football uh schools will likely say yes but we want a maximum of five for instance um the in volleyball they may say well we're going to have a maximum of two uh, or whatever they, their thoughts are um, the idea is, is that if we set a minimum that the school is going to be responsible to pay for that minimum number of officials, regardless of how many are actually used. So, for instance, in volleyball, if we were going to say we're going to use two referees and two line judges uh, and they decided, well, we're not going to bring in line judges, then uh, then they would have to pay for them anyways. And that would go to the two uh, remaining officials. The, the conflict that we're going to run into is that some schools may say, you're going to set a minimum. And in our area, we don't have enough officials to staff two officials on a contest, let alone four. I, I'm already thinking of the arguments that are going to be made, but it is certainly up for discussion and it would include line judges as well. Brent, I have, I have, I have a suggestion and I would like to use volleyball as the pilot for this. I would like to see Michigan High School Athletics um, take a stance that every team must have a certified official, volleyball official on their bench. That could be the JV coach, that could be uh, the manager, um, that could be a, a parent, someone else that is a certified official that We're number one could step in number step two could add to the um the ambience of the the match i just think if we tried that um and this, and and i'm sure michigan high school athletics would waiver their fee um for membership at least for the first year or the school could pick it up but to have somebody else there that has the knowledge or the capability of stepping in if an official is not there. Um, we are short officials this year in volleyball. Uh, schools are all having volleyball teams again. This would be a great opportunity for uh, Michigan High School Athletics to promote officials and getting new officials in. Yeah, and so I, uh, I don't, I, I think I, I'm on the same page with you. So we, um, we are offering, we, we regularly offer uh, first time officials free registrations. Uh, in addition to that, this year, we've also started telling athletic directors that regardless of what year they are as official, we are willing to give them a free registration so that we have registered officials in certain sports. Now that may not be all of our sports, um, but uh, that we want them to be uh, registered officials because uh, in those emergency circumstances, they can step in. But also uh, if someone is registered official, they have a little bit of stake in the game and they may want to um, encourage others to join officiating too. So. I, I think we're thinking along the same lines. Um, I am open. If you know of coaches that are interested in uh, just starting their registration. Now, remember this year, they have to complete their rules meeting if they are going to jump on a, a varsity contest by chance. So, I mean, excuse me, on a high school contest, and that would include sub varsity as well. Um, so they may be resistant there, but I am open. And if you send me their uh, that you have somebody, assistant coach or somebody else that wants a free registration their first year, let me know and I will get that out to you right away. All right. Well, 
Sharon, I appreciate uh, you presenting tonight. I appreciate all the input and thoughts that were, uh, were also uh, given uh, and, and provided for this presentation. Um, it has been recorded. We will be releasing it on July 31st, along with a number of other presentations that we have, sports specific and uh, general officiating. This is the last presentation for volleyball, but we will have a number of other presentations that will be available in recorded version and over the next couple of days as we try to uh, squeeze in our last few. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I hope that you found this informative and uh, we will see you all as the season begins. Take care and have a great season. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon.